I truly want the best for what wants the best in you. Yeah. And people love that. They love that, man. I'm trying to figure out what's the best for us. Really. The best. Not the best for me, although that's part of it. Because here I am, you know, and I'm in the game too. I'm so greedy, let's say. I don't just want the best for me. That's not enough for me. I'm too greedy for that. Maybe I'm too selfish for that. I want the best for me in a way that's the best for everyone else too. Because that's even better. That's another interesting thing about being bounded by death. You have nothing to lose. You might as well aim for the highest goal because what have you got to lose that you aren't already going to lose? Nothing. Nothing. And you have everything, hypothetically, to gain. If you want to go to university and become a physician, there's a lot of sacrifice of impulsive gratification that goes along with that. But if you become a physician, then it's a noble enterprise, people support you socially, and all the needs that you need to have fulfilled will also be fulfilled by that enterprise. Well, that's a way better model. Well, that's a way better model. It's strange that the maximum freedom comes with the adoption of a discipline and then also the adoption of responsibility. That frees you up and everyone else around you in the long run. And if you explain that to people, especially in this day and age when they'd be fed a never-ending diet of idiot rights and freedoms, they're immediately on board with it because they know, they know that most of the meaning that people experience in their life is a consequence of adopting responsibility. Adopting responsibility. So they're starving for that. They're starving for that. They're starving for that. The idea to be articulate. It's as if something like the following happened as humanity developed. First, were the endless tens or hundreds of thousands of years prior to the emergence of written history and drama. During this time, the twin practices of delay and exchange begin to emerge slowly and painfully. Then they become represented in metaphorical abstraction as rituals and tales of sacrifice told in a manner such as this. It's as if there's a powerful figure in the sky who sees all and is judging you. Giving up something you value seems to make him happy. And you want to make him happy because all hell breaks loose if you don't. So, practice sacrificing and sharing until you become expert at it. And things will go well for you. No one said any of this, at least not so plainly and directly, but it was implicit in the practice and then in the stories. Said as well. Action came first, as it had to, as the animals we once were could act, but could not think. People watched the successful succeed and the unsuccessful fail for me. For thousands and thousands of years, we thought it over and drew a conclusion. The successful among us delayed gratification. The successful among us bargained with the future. A great idea begins to emerge, taking ever more clearly articulated form, ever more clearly articulated stories. What's the difference between the successful and the unsuccessful? The successful sacrifice. Things get better as the successful practice their sacrifice. The questions become increasingly precise and simultaneously broader. What is the greatest possible sacrifice for the greatest possible good? And the answers become increasingly deeper and profound. The God of Western tradition, like so many gods, requires sacrifice. But sometimes, he goes even further. He demands not only sacrifice,
sacrifice, but the sacrifice of precisely what is love best. We'll start our analysis with a truism, stark, stark, self-evident, and understated. Sometimes things do not go well. That seems to have much to do with the terrible nature of the world, with its plagues and famines and tyrannies and betrayals. But here's the rub. Sometimes when things are not going well, it's not the world that's the cause. The cause is instead that which is currently most valued subjectively and personally. Because the world is revealed to an indeterminate degree through the template of your values. Thus, if the world you are seeing is not the world you want, it's time to examine your values. It's time to rid yourself of your current presuppositions. It's time to let go. Time to sacrifice what you love best so that you can become who you might become instead of staying who you are. Something valuable given up ensures future prosperity. Something valuable sacrificed pleases the Lord. What is most valuable and best sacrificed? What is at least emblematic of that? A choice cut of meat, the best animal in a flock, a most valued possession. What's above even that? What constitutes the ultimate sacrifice for the gain of the ultimate prize? It's a close race between child and self. The sacrifice of the mother offering her child to the world is exemplified profoundly by Michelangelo's great sculpture, Paeda. Michelangelo crafted Mary, cradling the nearly naked body of her adult son, crucified and ruined. It's her fault. It was through her that he entered the world and its great drama of being. Is it right to bring a baby into this terrible world? Every woman asks herself that question. Some say no, and they have their reasons. Mary answers yes, voluntarily, knowing full well what's to come. As do all mothers, if they allow themselves to see. It's an act of supreme courage when it's undertaken voluntarily. In turn, Mary's son, Christ, offers himself to God and the world to betrayal, torture, and death. To the very point of despair on the cross, where he cries out those terrible words, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That is the archetypal story of the man who gives his all for the sake of the better, who offers up his life for the advancement of being, who allows God's will to become manifest fully within the confines of a single mortal life. That is the model for the honorable man. In Christ's case, however, as he sacrifices himself, God, his father, is simultaneously sacrificing his son. It is for this reason that the Christian sacrificial drama of son and self is archetypal. It's a story at the limit where nothing more extreme, nothing greater, can be imagined. That's the very definition of archetype. And that's the core of what constitutes religious. Pain and suffering define the world. Of that, there can be no doubt. Sacrifice can hold pain and suffering in abeyance to a greater or lesser degree. And greater sacrifices can do that more effectively than lesser. Of that, 
there can be no doubt. Everyone holds this knowledge in their souls. Thus, the person who wishes to alleviate suffering, who wishes to rectify the flaws in being, who wants to bring about the best of all possible futures, who wants to create heaven on earth, will make the greatest of sacrifices of self and of child, of everything that is loved, to live a life aimed at the good. He will forego expediency. He will pursue the path of ultimate meaning. And he will, in that manner, bring salvation to the ever-desperate world. Archetypal themes are archetypal because they actually speak of the structure of human experience. That's why they last. And human experience has a pattern. You don't have the capacity to articulate that pattern as an individual, in part because your life is too short. You just can't figure it out. But the ancient representations of those patterns are everywhere around you. You know some of them in image, you, you cotton on to them automatically, you fall into them if you go to a movie, for example, because movies always express archetypal themes. If you hear them articulated, you think, I knew that, I knew that, I knew that, I knew that. That's the platonic idea of learning as remembering. Your soul already knows. But it doesn't have the words. But it doesn't have the words. But it doesn't have the words.